Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution. 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 Do you want a revolution? Yeah. You say you want a revolution. Revolution. The revolution. It's going on right now. Welcome to The Revolution, the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we ask today's most successful entrepreneurs to share the tools and strategies they use to build relationships and connections to grow their revenue. Now, now, your host for The Revolution, John Corcoran. All right, welcome everyone. John Corcoran here. I'm the host of this show and you know, every week I get to talk to interesting CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of all kinds of companies. Check out some of the archives because we've got some great episodes with founders or CEOs of Netflix and Kinko's and YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard, Lending Tree, OpenTable, and many more. I'm also the co-founder of Rise25, where we help connect B2B business owners to their ideal prospects. And this is part of our top agency leader series, where we have been interviewing some of the leaders in the agency space, which is a critical area of our, our economy that has really been helping with other companies to transition into the more digital world that we live in these days. And my guest today, his name is Peter Gerritsen, and he is the president at TAN Worldwide, which is an organization, a collective of sorts of different uh, member agency companies. There's 50 plus member companies all over the world, advertising agencies primarily operating in 30 countries. 60 cities worldwide. He's also a 30-year veteran of working inside of agencies, and he's a speaker and thought leader for agencies. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that area of the economy has been affected over recent years and some of the things that are on the horizon. Of course, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B businesses to get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with done-for-you podcasts and content marketing. And if you're listening to this and never thought, now oh, should I start a podcast? I've been doing it for 12 years, and I tell everyone, absolutely yes. Go to rise25media.com, and there's lots of resources there. You can learn about how to do it, or feel free to contact us. All right, Peter, uh, pleasure to talk to you. And uh, funny story, Peter's from a uh, part of Massachusetts that I lived in previously. And you know, Peter, you had spent many, many years working in agencies, um, and you had a, a hard pivot in, in your career uh, back in 2007, going from running agencies and on the creative side, you weren't on the, on the account side, you're more on the creative side to then running a community of agency owners, which gets into all kinds of different challenges um, around running a community. And um, so what, what inspired that? Were you burnt out on the creative side of working within agencies or are you looking for a new challenge or did the opportunity present, it, present itself? How'd you get into that? Um, maybe all the above and maybe none. I don't know. It's, it's, it's um, yeah, I've been, I started and built an agency with my partner and then a group of partners. Um, and we built a very successful B2B shop uh, in Boston. And I, and I came to the point where it was after 9-11, which changes a lot of people's perspective on things. Sure. And, you know, and I was like, I'm not sure how much more I can do with this. And it, it was a good 17 years of probably a hundred plus hours a week. Mm. Um, and, raising two kids. Um, and now that they're old, they were older at the starting get older at the time. And now you know, college ages and they're moving out. And, you know, I, st I don't know how I managed to do it, but I still coach sports and all that stuff while the kids were, you know, running an agency. Um, and I had some very good partners, um, that really were taking the agency in another direction. And I found, you know, yes, I'm a creative person. Um, but I found, what I really enjoyed about the agency was, and the work I did wasn't so much the, yes, the creative product to solve problems. I, I yes, that was, that's a whole part of it. But what really got me going was the chemistry of the people and the problem. And how do you put the right people together to allow them to get to the best solution for clients? Um, and at the same time, my organization, my, we were members of this organization, TAN, which we did for international exposure. That's the ways we joined it. But what I learned was there's a whole bunch of mentors in the business that I could learn a lot about the, about the business, what to do, what not to do, how to change things, um, how to evaluate who you are. And they changed the scope of our business. Um, and so that when I left the agency, um, I, I called it retiring from the agency at the time. You know, 
I'm in my 40s. It's not really retiring, but that's the way it kind of felt like it. Um, at the same time, Tan came to me and asked me if I'd be interested in taking on the role of president. And I said, be careful what you wish for, um, because I am a creative. I'm not a, I suck at administration stuff. And here I, now I'm in a job that I have to do the, the accounting books and I have to write agendas and I have to do all, a lot of organizational oh, writing. admin stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. And then I wasn't good at it when I had my agency, let alone, you know, now I have to do it and I'm leading it. Um, and, but I said, what I am good at is diving down the rabbit hole and getting off on tangents to hunt down things that are interesting, new and, and helpful, or at least to challenge the way you think. Um, so they took, they took it on, they took me on and I took them on and said, okay, what I'm going to do first off, it's, it's a traditional agency network. I, it needs to be an eclectic mix of experts across the world, um, which means take communications and then divide it up into all the different kinds of pieces of communications. There's public relations, traditional advertising and research and media buying and design. Uh, all those things encompass and make up what is communications and the agency space. Um, it doesn't have to be traditional creative work. Um, it, it just, it's problem solving using communication tools. That's really what I looked at. So my job and my mission was to find people around the world that are doing interesting things in that space that may want to belong to an organization that's willing to share the good, bad, and ugly in detail and create a trust network that, you know, it's, it's yes, it's peers. And there's lots of networks like TAN but TAN really belongs in a category of trusted peers that are willing to tell you the good, the good shit and the bad shit. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I want to ask because TAN had been around since I believe the 1930s. Yep. Um, what was it like taking over an organization that had been around that long? There, you know, it, whenever you hear about that, right there, there has to be some housekeeping house cleaning uh, that needs to be done. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it, it definitely was, you know, as the old adage is the old boys network for many decades, that's what it was, um, had changed when I, when I was a member, it started to change. Um, and you know, the whole idea of getting together and have boondoggles and all that kind of thing. And I think that's a, still an opinion of what networks can be like. Um, and it wasn't a matter so much as eliminating things that were there but putting more into the pot um, and self and, and there's a bit of self-selecting that happened out of that too um, for the organization. Uh, the one of the things about TAN is also you have to be voted in. So you have to basically sell yourself to the rest of the group on the value of being there. Um, you know, then they vote for you in and one, one, no vote, you don't get to be a member. Um, you know, it's not, um, uh, those organizations you know of that pay your pay your money, you can show up for the show up the door. Um, Is that hard for you as you know the head of this organization that you know moving from being a member to then you know being the head of this organization, depending on it for your livelihood and and maybe having expansion potential, wanting it to be bigger, but you're dealing with that tension. Like it's not like when you run an agency, like you want to take on more clients, you can. But now it's like you have 50 other members that you have to please. Yeah. Um, it, it, there are times when I rail against the concept because, yeah, I mean, it's a dues-based network, which means the number of people who are here pay X amount per month every year. Um, and that's the budget. And that we spend to go do things. It's a nonprofit organization and truly nonprofit. Um, <laughs> and uh, there are times when you look at agencies out there that you consider and say, well, um, we could use it for the budget this year, you know, especially when COVID hit. It's like, okay, what's going to happen? You know, what, where, how do we maintain this thing? Um, but it's, thankfully, there's also a board that helps me make decisions about things and, you know, that stand back. But they, they lean to my recommendations. And um, I think I've stayed pretty true to making sure 
they may not be the most profitable businesses brought in, um, or they may not be the biggest ones, but they're doing something unique and different that we can learn from. Um, and I've, and that has been maintained pretty much all the years I've been doing this. Yeah. Um, now you I've joined been longer. I've been president longest of anybody in the history of TAN. So, wow. Um, and, and you joined in 2007, not that much later, the financial crisis hits 2008, 2009. What was that like? Scary for everybody. It was, it was scary for everybody. Um, scary for the business, um, scary for any business at the time. Um, I think scary personally too. I, you know, I, you know, what, what, do, I'm doing, what have I done? Oh my gosh. I've embarked on a new career and all of a sudden. Yeah. And, and now it's like, okay, I've got kids in college. And, you know, and I got a big house and a big mortgage. And what the hell is this? What the hell was I thinking? Um, but I maintained and I, I, you know, yes, I had thoughts of, you know, do I go find something else to do? You know, um, but I said, I'm good. At, I believe I was, I'm good at what I do. I, I believe that, I believe TAN is a worthwhile organization for those who belong to it and understand it and embrace the concept. Um, and I believe I'm really good at being in the middle of the pie. You know, I, you know, for those of who, your listeners that are old enough to remember this, I feel I'm a little like, like Lily Tomlin at the switchboard. And, you know, back in her day of plugging in people around the world to give them opportunities that help their business. Um, and I'm really good at remembering who does what around the world. Um, and I'm really also really good at going out and hunting down somebody that we don't know yet. Um, what I'm not really good is the cold calling thing. Um, that I know that I'm just not, um, well, no one likes, no one likes cold calling or no. hardly anyone does. And I also found, was that, that something that you needed to do with this position or why, why would cold calling be required? Um, well, well, I think especially back in 2008, 2009, you'd, you're reaching out to agencies to try and join. Mm. Our, our best and most successful members have come through a connection of some sort. Um, yeah. Either they've heard me, seen me, or another, or they've met another member somewhere, um, and they're recommended. Um, that soft connection has been the most successful connection for TAM. Um, Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, yeah. Talk, let's talk about agencies in general right now. There's this larger digital transformation that's happening that was accelerated by COVID hitting in 2020. Um, what are some top challenges that agencies are facing right now? Um, well, I, th I think COVID created a whole bunch of, um, I would say, putting fire on the problem, um, trying to manage a marketplace that's in I wouldn't call it free fall. It's just, it's in no fall. We don't know what we're, nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, yeah. So, so marketers are holding on to their money. Um, agencies aren't spend, aren't getting it to be spent. Media doesn't know what they're going to do. The only media money that was happening was news money um, to be on that um, because there's plenty on the news um, to face that. Uh, the digital transformation, I do believe in our business, the communications firms that don't embrace digital to a certain ex to a certain extent, they may not be wholesale in it, but if they don't have some part of their business that revolves around digital, they're not going to be long term successful. Um, but I do think you can be an expert at parts of this business and not have a digital forefront, you know, front office, um, and be successful for your clients. Um, that comes to strategic thinking. I mean, smart people who understand how all this works will be successful in advertising and communications and in research and deciding how to help a business run. Um, marketing is a small piece of any business, um, but it's the connection to customers and prospects. Um, so the mo you need to focus on that, that piece in order to keep your business going. Engineering can only do so much for business. Production and warehouses can only do so much. Um, so what's, what's the adage? Um, marketing is the only part of a business that makes money for a company. Um, marketing and sales. Mm. That, you know, production doesn't do that. The lawyers don't do that. Much as you are the lawyer, the lawyers don't do it. 
They mm-hmm. save money. They save money. They protect people. Um, but right. yeah, but it's not um, the marketing. So yeah, I mean, I think what has happened in the past two years, especially, but then even this whole digital transformation is you got to get out of your own way and explore what's out there that can make you better using the tools that exist and not being afraid to experiment with the new things that happen. You know, um, like what you're doing with the podcast thing when it first happened and you've been doing this for so long, um, you jumped in and said, okay, let's just try this. You know, and And that was certainly me in the beginning for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and I think the best marketing firms are the ones that have a similar attitude of let's try this. Let's yeah. see where this goes. Um, Do you find and- that bringing the communities, the, the different eight members together, that that fosters that spirit of let's test stuff, let's innovate. If one agency sees another agency that's trying, you know, digital advertising or trying, I don't know, marketing on TikTok or something like that, that that fosters and encourages a spirit of um, others doing it as well. Yeah, I think. Um- and that's really the way TAN works in its live iteration up until the past two years, um, and which will come back again in, in this coming next year. Um, but what helps is, you know, I, I use the term a lot, good, the good, bad, and ugly that's shared amongst peers. Um, so I'd be willing to try some new things when I see a friend of, and peer of mine that's having success at something and was willing to tell me what they did and how it happened and what's good and bad about it and what they made mistakes at, it's like, oh, they give me a leg up to get started. On the same token, um, we take 10 and say, somebody will try something and they failed at it. And they're willing to stand up in front of everybody and say, I screwed this up. And I think this is how I screwed it up. And I'm open to hearing from all of you because I'm, I'm willing to bear my soul in front of you um, tell me where you think I screwed up because I need to find the, make sure I'm doing the right thing going forward. Um, and that's even, the, that's, that's even more rewarding than hearing the good stuff to have somebody stand up in front of you and say, boy, I really had it wrong. I'm and curious. I, I'm curious. It's not easy to foster that spirit of connectedness where people feel comfortable, where it's a safe space, where they can open up, where they can be honest, where they can share their failures. And I've been in advertising. Of- <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and in any industry, really, I mean, and I've been around, you know, I've been in communities like that or rooms like that before where you can tell it's just like people are not opening up at all here. And then I've been in other rooms where people are honest and open and they're even talking about personal things or, you know, relationship issues, stuff like that. Are you, you know, what are, what are some things that you do in order to foster that kind of spirit and to get people to open up? Um, well, man, I- you know, I think in the live meeting format, it is easier. I mean, that, you know, we, we put everybody in a room and you give them the form to stand up. And I usually pick one or two to start that I know something's going on and warn them and say, I'd like you to talk about this. And once it sets that, the right tone. Yeah. Um, and why I, I purposely try and pick something that's really cool that's happening, that's new, and we don't know if, it, if it's successful or not yet. Somebody who's done something um, that they all want to hear about because they know that there's some nugget they might use. And then somebody who ha- is having a, either a struggle or has failed. Um, and I get a lot of those calls and or communications with members of TAN and frankly, outside of TAN. Um, I have a lot of agencies contact me and say, you know, I'm not sure what I'm doing, if I'm doing it right or not. Can you just let me walk you through it? Um, and I, believe me, I don't know all the answers. In fact, I, I think um, every year I think I know less than I did before um, because there's so much more new that it makes me think about how I'm falling behind in learning and I keep trying to run faster and faster. Um, but what I think I've retained is the ability to look at something and say, I need to know more about that. Um, or I need to move, to, move on to something else. Um, 
I think I'm getting better. We all get hit with the emails constantly of stuff to come out. Finally, I think I'm finally getting better and saying, you know, this one's not going to be for me right now. Thank you very much. Good luck. Have, have a great successful business, but it's just not what I'm interested in. Um, and I don't know, maybe it's because I've gotten older. I'm more truthful for myself about the business. You know, I, I think I, I believe less in the propaganda that exists than I did before. Um, and, and I'm willing to tell those I work with when I don't know the answer. Um, hmm. that, and that's, that that's hard, part. isn't it? Right. I mean, because oh, yeah. the fear that, you know, if you say that to a group of your members that they're like, well, what am I doing here? Oh yeah. It happens all the time. I mean, I, you know, there's, uh, there's one going on this past week that, that I'm getting asked about a specific issue that you know, is proprietary. So I won't go into it, but I said, I don't know what the answer is to this. I don't know what even know where to go to find the answer, but I'll start hunting around and see if I can find something. Um, and a couple of other members stepped up and said, you know, I might have somebody we can tap into for this. Um, because, you know, I, I, I might be a little bit of, you know, I wouldn't call it the glue that holds it together. It's more like I'm this central figure within this organization. But the more the members are involved, they see that it is not a hub and spoke. It's a big wheel and it crosses all back and forth across cultures and peoples. And the more you embrace the unknown from somebody else, the more you can get from them to make you better. Um, you and I were talking earlier about uh, what I this fascinating thing that I do, which is the international stuff. Um, and yeah, and I do want to I want to ask you about that because, you know, it's, it's right in the name tan worldwide. You definitely embrace the international el el element of it. You talk about the importance of there being members from different parts of the globe. You also personally love travel, uh, like different cultures. So it's a little bit of kind of a chicken or the egg thing, right? You know, like I think you were drawn to, you know, the role because it would allow you to scratch that itch. And you've also definitely encouraged it, it seems. But but from where you sit, do you you know, people it's a cliche to say that the world is getting smaller and more interconnected. But do you see that? Have you seen that over the years? Um, yes and no. I think it is smaller because, you know, until recent until recently, and it will happen again, the ability to get from one culture to another, meaning going to another country, another place, another language, another system, and be exposed to it is gets infinitely easier than it was when we were kids. Yeah. Um, and just the fact that, um, and I've done it many a times, I can get on a plane from Boston and before, well, into the next day, I could be in Asia, um, still fascinates me, you know, and Amazing. I've done it, you know, I, that I could be dead tired and wake up and get off a plane and I'm in Hong Kong or I'm in Bangkok. Um, and be happy about it. Don't then not feel, um, you know, I have a friend that <laughs> I won't name here, but he, he's traveled internationally and he rails against the fact that he can't get a burger and a glass of a whiskey in certain parts of the world. <laughs> and it's like, but there's so much more. Mm. And I, I, he and I've had this discussion over and over again. <laughs> and it's like, you know, that, you got, we as humans have got to embrace. There are things out there that we don't know exist right now. Don't you want to know what they are? Mm. Um, and don't you want to know, hear somebody speak in a language that you have no idea what's coming out of them else, but this lilting or this, this poetry sound or music almost, when you listen to somebody speak their language that you don't understand, and you're trying to cipher parts of it, but if you just sit back and just listen to it, it's a beautiful sound, no matter what language it is. Um, even some of the um, Eastern Europeans, it's really harsh sound to it. There's something beautiful about listening to it. And, and how and do they, you see that helpful to the members in terms of um, kind of idea exchange? 
You know, um, is it is it because there's so much in common or is it just like an openness to new ideas? I think, well, I do believe that we all should be exposed to different things that we're not used to. I mean, I think you need to be a fish out of water in environments and places that make you sit back and judge who you are and what you are and what you believe. Um, and I think TAN is really good at doing that. I mean, we have these three meetings a year, one's in North America and one's European and one's somewhere else in the world. And when we go and we try and make sure it's not just in a meeting room and you get out and see things. And I encourage people to come early to meetings and stay later to the meetings just to embrace where they are. Um, and it happens within the organization where you get our friends from Beirut coming to a meeting and you're sitting down with them before the meeting starts and you, and you know them. So you, you can start into a conversation and you could, you could turn to Alan and say, okay, so this explosion happens in Beirut. How do you handle that? You know, how, how in this world, what we're trying just to survive is a foreign subject for those of us who just are trying to make money and make our business better. Um, you know, I think it changes the way you think about who you are. Um, and I do believe- And, and you're can, not exaggerating. That was one of your members that yeah. was the, based in Beirut. They had a, a massive explosion. I think yeah. I forget it was six months ago or something like that now. Um, that they were on the other side of a building and the, the, the other side of the building, if they'd been on the other side, all the windows are blown out and everything. Crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, and with the other, the other one I, th I think about often is our, our member was in Ukraine and back in the, the Crimea uh, invasion thing. And he's in his office. He's got a small agency in, uh, in Kiev. Um, and he's looking out the window while he's on the phone with me and saying, Pete, there are tanks rolling down the street. How am I going to sell cars? Wow. You know, you know, and it's like, I don't know. I don't know how you, what how you, do you can be do? safe is what you know, I'm first it, thinking it, of. Jeez. You know, and he's, th and he's like, you know, I'm running an agency and yeah, you know, I need to call home and make sure that the family's fine. So how do I help marketers sell stuff right now when people are just trying to survive? Um, and we and, can and, sit and, back and, and, say, and, yeah. and how does that affect you, you know, having that experience? Or how does that you said you think about it a lot? I do. Um, I want to be a good human. And I think to be a good human is to understand those who are not me um, and, the, and the way I think. And sometimes it doesn't work so well. Um, you know, and aside from the politics part, you know, which, you know, we get into and yes, I rail against a lot of things that happen, but I think I can do better work at communicating things, but understanding things, understanding the differences in the way people live allows you to see what's common to come up with a language of communicating something to them. You know, the, it's not all sales and price off, you know, it's about how to make a connection to somebody in, in here. Um, it's something we used to say when back at our, my agency days and when we first started the agency and we did a lot of B2B and we always said, engineers are people too. We need to communicate to engineers as people, not just speeds and feeds. Um, and how do we do that the way that breaks through? I think that still holds true in everything we all do. You know, you sell legal services is connecting to people to solve something um, and understand who that person is, not just the legal books that you can pull over and do this, which is the same thing as digital. Um, those are tools to accomplish something. What are you trying to accomplish is the thing you're trying to figure out and do a better job of. Um, and then just know the tools well enough to, to implement them in the most efficient and cost-effective way. Um, you mentioned politics and, um, you know, you're someone who, I guess, where's your politics a little bit on the sleeve, uh, you might say, right? You yeah. come from the kind of left side of the spectrum. Um, and you're not shy about sharing your political views. There are those, though, who run communities who would worry about sharing their opinions, whether it's about politics or something else, because they're worried about alienating their members. How do you reconcile that? Um, well, this is 
like everything I tell you, it's a long answer. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was born in New York City. I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, my younger years, I my father was in the Navy, so we did a lot of the East Coast, living in a lot of different places. And then, but basically, I grew up in Philadelphia. Um, and then when we started the agency, I moved to Boston. And I was a bit of a fish out of water going to Boston. Um, and but I've been I was there for 33 years until this past August. Um, and I fully embrace the concept of the society can only improve by its lowest common denominators being raised. Um, and I and I do believe that. Um, and I think the New Yorker Philadelphian, I grew up in, you know, I didn't grow up in Chicago, but all these places were tough places, you know, people who are willing to speak their mind out, out loud. Um, and I was not really good at that myself. Um, and, you weren't good uh, at speaking your mind. No, um, Why? I, I think I kept, I, I think I kept a lot of it in. Um, Why? Um, I don't think I was sure enough of myself um, to be able to have, to take that stand. I think I was still a bit of the uh, Plato of, you know, who am I going to be? You know, what's this? Quite, quite a revolution evolution then, since now you are someone who helps others by sharing those sharing opinions or making and, connections to help people, to guide people. And I don't shut up. That's the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, um, making up for lost time. Yeah. I, that's, I think that is part of it. Um, but I, you know, I think it was interesting for me, you know, coming from being a founder of an advertising agency, which is about communicating and talking. And I don't think I was really good at it then. I think I was good at helping the others around me be good at it. Um, and I found, I found my voice when I joined TAM. And I think part of that really was all these other cultures and ideas coming together in one place. And the only way I could make them all see what, they're, what, what value they've got around them was to open my mouth and you know, pull this person over here and say, here, here, you need to talk to this person here. And here's why I can tell you the pieces you should just bring up. And those, that's, that's where the innovation is going to happen. And um, yeah, I, you know, the politics side, I don't write, I don't get on and blog about all those things. Um, but, you know, I sure have my, my strong beliefs. I, what I don't want to do is hurt TAN as an organization because we do have a lot of voices coming from a lot of places. You and know, and uh, has that ever happened? Has there ever been a member who's been like, I can't take this anymore, I'm out of here? Or just where it's um, feathers, maybe not quite to the level of people quitting? Um, there's been a little bit. I, I'd say it might. there's been some more of the other way of some members saying, I'm not sure I, I, I can feel comfortable with so-and-so in the room uh, because of the way they behave. Referring to you or someone else? They're, they're referring to someone else, you know, mm -hmm. and me being the person to sort of, how do I, do I smooth this? Do I address this? How do I do that? Um, and I've had, how to do, do you both. navigate those issues? I do both. I mean, I, depending on what happens, but I think you have to sit down with certain people and explain that there is a difference. I mean, sometimes it was, it was generational. Some of it was cultural. Um, and I do think there are things that are right and wrong. But I think there is a fringe area where we may think of some things as wrong, but that's, they don't see it. If you explain to somebody, they may see it, but it's not inherent in their culture to, to know that that's, a, that that's a wrong approach. I mean, I think, um, I, think the, uh, I think what helps is bringing people in that have a broader mind and ability to speak that. You know, uh, one of the things I... Uh, the diversity issue is something that all organizations need to focus on more. TAN has not done traditionally a good a job at it as I want it to be. And that's one of my bailiwicks now. I mean, I, I, we got to learn from those who we aren't. Um, and the more we have that exposure to other people, the more we'll be willing to accept it. Um, and, uh, it's not critical race theory. You know, I, I, what it is, is cultural understanding. Um, and that means gender, age, 
religion, all those things. Um, it's a. Uh, it was funny. Uh, I don't know if it's funny or not. Um, so I'm in. I'll give you a quick story of that. So I'm in Kuala Lumpur. <laughs> this is me sound like a real international guy, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm in Kuala Lumpur. I'm with um, one of the TAN members at the time. And it's my first trip there. And the, the two guys are, are Muslim that I'm, I'm out with. And we go to a bar. Um, and so I ask the question. It's like, okay, so are you comfortable with this? Well, how does this stand with who you are as a person? They're like, he, said, he, he apologized to me and said, understand that I don't, I don't drink. But I surely love being out with people and what they're, what they're doing. And 80% of my cultural religious upbringing is about embracing those who we're not. It's not reading the Quran. It's not objecting to the Bible. It's not any of those things. It's who we are and who we are not. And let's make sure we can, we can get along. And Mike, this is actually a great conversation to have. Because I, it, it, he destroyed, well, destroyed's not the right word, took down a lot of stereotypes I had in my head for many years, and he did it in an hour's time. Mm. And, um, <laughs> and, you know, and then we went off and had some crazy adventures and did all sorts of things, and he became a friend for a long time. And, and then so and, it, and it, that's happened countless number of times. That kind of conversation thing has happened to me over and over again, um, breaking down the way I thought about something and seeing it from a different point of view. Mm. So if I'm reading this right, um, the original question was about your political views, sharing your political views and concern about members, you know, and, and things like that. But it seems like it, it's, it's authentic because on the one because because your, your part of your message is that we need to embrace different cultures and differences of opinions. And for you to not share your political beliefs would be in a sense inauthentic. I don't know if you would express it that way, but it, it seems like it's more authentic to the message, which is we need to embrace diversity of opinions, diversity of thought, diversity of experiences, diversity of backgrounds. Um, well, I, I think, and I think there is a little difference between me as a person and me and my role um, uh, and what I have to do. I mean, I do think I have to hold back on certain things and you know, not, not rail against somebody without really understanding who they are. But I will rail against those who I um, disagree with. Um, as is your think, right, right? As is your yeah. right. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. but, I, but I do think I have to understand, you know, as president of TAN worldwide, there are opinions and places and political perspectives that are embraced outside of what I believe is right within our organization and around the world that I need to live with them and share with them and grow with them and frankly, embrace them for being friends that I don't agree with in all, in all forms. Um, I do think within TAN as an organization, just like there's a certain character and caliber of person who, who is right for this organization that holds true in the way they believe in all this we're talking about too. Um, there are, I'd say as an organization over the years, only about one in six or seven agencies to, that I talk to is right and or will join TAN, it is right for this organization. One in um, six or seven. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most, of, most people call me and they're saying, how much business am I going to get to join this network? And it's like, <laughs> none. You're going to get none. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. You're going to get no business from joining TAN unless you open up, trust, share, give, collaborate, and see people as a peer. Um, then it might happen. But all that stuff has to happen first. Um, then they trust you and say, you know, I think they could, that, I think you could help me solve this problem. And I'll help, we'll share the revenue from that to get there. Um, that, yeah. So that I think. So the politics question is, I don't want to embarrass 
the members by me going off on a tangent um, in the wrong venue or not. Although, you know, like I told you this story about, you know, um, my one political st story I'll tell you, which you know of already, is so the day that the last, the 2016 election happened, I'm, I was in Buenos Aires speaking, scheduled to speak the day after the U.S. election um, to an international group of marketers about the truth in advertising. That was my topic I was talking about, with the importance of telling the truth in communications. And here is Trump, Trump winning this election. I stay up all night, panicked for multiple reasons, panicked because I am a liberal and a liberal and social thing. And I'm like, what is going on here? How did this happen? Um, and then like, okay, so what do I tell these people? I've got hundreds of people going to be in this ballroom tomorrow morning. What are they going to do? Um, and I decided to keep my, my, most of my presentation as, as it was. And I just decided I started off with a big picture of Trump on the screen and said, you know, before I talk about the topic you, you brought me in for, I need to address this, you know, pointed to the picture of him. And I said, you know, I apologize on behalf of the, you know, the, the U.S. citizens for the evil that will be brought, wrought on the, uh, all of us around the world for what just happened yesterday. Um, and I hope that we all can find truth in what the world should be moving forward. Then I clicked to my next slide, which said, you know, the, the truth, the importance of communications and truth in communications. And everybody just started laughing. You know, it's like, okay, this, there's common ground here. Um, and that was, that was the extent of the political conversation. The rest of it had nothing to do with politics and I didn't address it anymore. But I, 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 I went straight for the monkey in the room, got to it and moved on. Still pissed about what happened, but that's you know where where it was, right? Um, so right. yeah, okay. So I, I I promised myself I wasn't going to do anything political in your in this podcast with you, and there I went. <laughs> I have a way of extracting that out of people from time to time. What can I say? You know, um, yeah, well, I mean, I, I think it is uh, consistent, you know, with the message. So I, I think that's great. Um, you know, we're running a little short on time. We're actually over on time oh, right oh, now. Yeah, so sure we are. yeah, so uh, sorry about that, but. Um, uh, I do want to ask you a couple of final questions. First of all, okay. um, I did the math and I think you're about 15, uh, 15 years away from the centennial of TAN worldwide. What do you, oh, yeah. as you look towards that centennial, no doubt planning has begun in earnest and you've been planning for a couple of years now, I'm sure, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, as you take an organization into its second century uh, that was founded in 1936 and all this digital transformation that's happening right now, that's been accelerated by COVID, what, what's top of mind? What do, what do you think needs to be done? Uh, what's, how, what is the role of face-to-face -face, uh, in this digital world that we're moving into where obviously we're all going to be in the metaverse any day now, right? So um, well, I've thrown a lot like, at you there, but you take what I, you pick. I take what you like. I, I would hope in, the, in this X number of years before the centennial that AI really is is robust enough that, that there'll be one for it to run tan. Oh, they can plan um, it, they, right? You know, the they, AI can they, plan they, it. They, they can do it. All, they can do all that work. Um, yeah. Um, I think secondarily, I think it's a crapshoot if I make it to that point. So we'll see. You know, um, not even just the member. Will I be here on on this earth at that point? I don't know. Um, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, I think uh, move on to those around. Um, uh, I think um, it's going to be different. And I can't see where it's going to be. But I think for me, the big thing is not to say no, is but to say yes. And let's figure out where what's coming up over the horizon and be excited about it and embrace it. Um, and you know, as what, what's the old adage of in, in war, plan, all planning goes to shit once the first once the first bomb drops. I, I think all the planning in the world can't plan for what's going to happen fifteen years from now. Um, all we can do is have is create a mindset 
that we want to make it better, whatever it is. Um, and if we can evaluate things and, and write things and build things with that in mind, it'll be okay. That's a, that's a great point to end on. Um, but I do have one final question. Before I do that, first, a quick shout out. I didn't mention it at the beginning, but David C. Baker, one of my past guests, who first told me, uh, you got to reach out to Peter. He'd be a great person to talk to. So thank you, David. <laughs> And, um, you know, wrapping things up, I'm a big fan of gratitude, you know, and you're such a well-connected guy uh, across, you know, the globe, really. Um, if you look around at your peers and your contemporaries, others in your industry, however you want to define that, who do you respect? Who do you admire that's doing good work these days? Um, I, th I think, you know, when one of the... I'll give you a couple smaller examples and one bigger one. I mean, I, I'll start with the oldest one I can think of there, uh, who's no longer with us is a man named Jerry Gibbons. He's at a, um, he was an advertising classic. You know, he was the two martini lunch kind of classic advertising guy. Um, built his career out of San Francisco, built a couple of agencies, became one of the leaders of the four A's, which is the international, it was the U S version of, um, the Commerce Department. Um, he took me by the shoulders and showed me what's good and what's bad about this business. Um, and he died a few years ago, um, having grown up on a ranch and been a farmer and ended up being in this business. And as he kind of told me is, don't take any of it seriously. Um, don't take yourself seriously, mostly, um, and be and, and, and embrace the fact that you don't know what the hell is going on from day to day. That's OK. Um, so I think, Tim, there's a woman, Megan Kennedy, uh, out of Atlanta, and she she runs a small agency called Orange Sparkle Ball. Um, she's a member of TAN. Um, but when I first met her, I can't remember how I met her. and We got connected somehow. And I forgive, forgive me to whoever what made that connection happen. Um, but my first phone call with her was supposed to have been 20 minutes, ended up being almost two and a half hours of just the things that came out of her mouth, which was coming out of her head about innovation and moving and thinking and how you have to be different and sharing all those things. And here's a woman who um, really lives what she says. You know, she was uh, originally a CDC researcher on HIV who drops that, goes back to school for engineering at, at, um, at Georgia Tech, and then builds an agency that's about helping businesses figure out how to be innovative. Um, it's, she's just, and, and then spends her nights railing against the political systems. I mean, she's just out, and she just, um, I'm amazed by the way she thinks. Um, and then I think, then there's the, the smaller people out there. There's a guy I know that um, was in this business, um, and his name I, I, I don't want to mention because I, you know, I think he's one for definitely don't want the fame of those out there. But he's a painter. Um, he's a, an artist. Um, he's a sculptor, and he was a professor of mine when I was in art school. That you know, yeah, I went to art school, all things, and I don't have <laughs> that. I I started off in pre meds till I, as I always put it, it was too hard, and I went to art school. Um, <laughs> that I, and he showed me how to think critically about the work you do, and judge it always for never being good enough, but satisfied enough to pass it, to say it's done. You know, it's like okay. You know, the masters always say, I, 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 this, this work is never finished, or those who just bang things out and, you know, sell them. And he was always like, there's a balance in here. Um, and um, I won't say his name. Steve, Tar Steve Tarantel was, a, and his daughter is a, a news anchor in Boston now. Um, but he, he just changed me in, in art school. Um, That's right. That's and right. I, so... Those are, those are my ones. Okay, so I now I really well up your time. Well done. No, it was great. The 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 orchestra did not run you off. So uh, this is great, Peter. Where can people go learn more about you, connect with you, and learn more about Tan? Uh, www. 
T-A-A-N.org. Um, you'll find us there um, on a, what now need, needs to be. It's an outdated website needs to be done, but I'll be doing that in the next. Cobbler shoes, always the case. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, John, it was great to meet you and spend this time. I had a great time in our previous conversations. This is great. Um, Excellent. Good luck. Rise 25. Keep it up. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast with John Corcoran. Find out more at smartbusinessrevolution.com. And while you're there, sign up for our email list and join the revolution. 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 And be listening for the next episode of the Smart Business Revolution podcast.